not the absence of war. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. You can have peace in trouble. You can have peace in war. You can have peace in difficulty. And Jesus is the prince of that peace. Turn to your neighbor there and say, I'm going to have me some peace this morning. I'm going to have me some peace this morning. What that means is you're going to put your phone down, you're going to turn off the TV to start with. Say, what? <laughs> Some people tell me, Carrie, you're not making the Word of God practical. I don't know how much more practical you can make it. <laughs> because you become... Have you noticed that our devices <laughs> require us to look at them? You gotta look at your computer screen. You gotta look at your phone. No matter what kind you got, you gotta look at it at some point. Did you know it's a biblical principle that you become what you look at? You become what you look at. Now turn to the person beside you and say, I'm gonna change what I'm looking at. <laughs> Technology is not a bad thing. I'm grateful for it. I use it. It helps me. Uh, I remember the days when in preparing a message I had to get out six or seven commentaries and three or four Bibles of, of various and, and, and sundry versions and try to get a, a full picture of, of what I thought the Lord had put on my heart. And that used to require a lot of moving books around. Maybe that's why I was thinner then. I don't know. But anyway... This technology has, has put things in my fingertips. I am grateful for that. Uh, especially with somebody with a short memory like mine. I know that you don't know how this is. But I can think of something I really want to find out. And then I start looking through many things to find out whatever information I wanted to find out. And by the time I get to what I wanted to find out, I've forgotten what it is. Yeah, don't laugh. You do just like that normal thing. That's right. That's right. Technology is a good thing. Actually, it's not a good thing. It's an amoral thing, which means it's neither good nor bad. It depends on how you use it. Language is a good thing, wouldn't you agree? Language, what you speak, is a good thing. But don't people pervert language? And yet people still speak. Christians still use language. But people pervert it. Why don't we apply that same logic to technology? Just a thought this morning. Technology is a good thing. I'm grateful for it. But we become like what we view. We become like what we look at. Uh, <clears throat> some of you know that I like to play the guitar a little bit. And <laughs> I remember when I was a, a young man, uh, most of you know I grew up in a musical family or for those of you who know that, and we sang. That's what we did. We sang. Everybody else played basketball, baseball, uh, went to parties, did all kinds of things. We sang. Carrie, what are you doing this week? We sang. What you doing tomorrow? We sang. You got anything going on next week? We sang. We are singing. That's what we did. Did you know I never wanted to sing? Not a day in my life have I ever woke awakened and wanted to sing. Now, I'm not saying that singing's a bad thing or that I'm against singing. I'm just saying it was never really in my heart. But the first time I heard this instrument, something resonated in, part of the pun, resonated in me. And I've never been the same since. While there's not a morning I get up and think, you know, I, I want to sing this morning. Often I get up and say, I really want to play. I really want to hear. I really want to, that wonderful... Heaven's most popular instrument, by the way. Uh, but people would give me, at an early age, when I began to try to play guitar, people would give me catalogs that had guitars in them. Wonderful pictures. They would give me calendars. that Other, other young kids had pictures of cars and women on their walls. Man, I had pictures of guitars if I could have put a picture on the wall. Not at Sybil's house, thank you very much. But if I could have, just in case... 
over in the corner of my closet, I had calendars and uh, catalogs and other pictures I had gained here and there of guitars. I love the instrument. I love to look at the instrument. I still do. love to look at the instrument. Not only hear it, it's just a wonderful thing for me. Some people call that a fetish. I call it joy. Right. I love the instrument to this day. But in looking at that instrument, I was propelled to pursue my passion. What you look at is very, very very important. Because what you look at, the pictures you see determine your perspective. Let me say that again. The pictures you see in your mind and with your eyes determine your perspective. And perspective is important. How you see God this morning is important. Let me tell you a quick little story about perspective. There were two young kids uh, two young boys walking down the streets in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was fairly late at night. And as they went by this blind alley, this huge dog ran out and attacked one of the boys. Well, the other young man had the presence of mind uh, to pick up. He found a two before lane close by and he killed the dog. Saved his friend's life, possibly. Well, there was a reporter that got wind of this story. And so he rang up the little boy, or the young man, and he said, uh, I've heard your story. He said, can I, can I come by and, and write it down in your words? The young man said, well, sure. So he goes over to the young man's house, gets the story down, finds out all the gory details. And then he says, this story will be in the paper tomorrow. He said, it'll be headlines. So sure enough, the next day, the little boy went down the street, picked up a paper, and the paper headline read... Friend, excuse me, what did it say? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's bad when you tell the story, forget what it said. It said, Timberwolves fan, this is Minnesota, remember, I don't even know what Timberwolves are, I guess they're a football team, but anyway. Timberwolves fan saves friend from rabid Rottweiler. The little boy calls up the reporter and says, uh, I am not a Timberwolves fan. Didn't care about the rest of the story. I'm not a Timberwolves fan. The reporter said, I'll make a note of that. I'll put it in, in the paper tomorrow. It will be headlines again. So the next day, the little boy goes down and gets a paper. And sure enough, there's the headline. And it reads, Vikings fan saves friend from rabid Rottweiler. The young man called the paper and he said, look, I am not a Vikings fan. And the reporter asked a very important question. He said, well, do you play sports? Do you like sports at all? He said, yes. He said, I'm a Rams fan. The next morning, the reporter said, I'll make a note of that. It'll be in the paper tomorrow. The little boy went down and got the paper, and sure enough, in the headlines, it read, <clears throat> Idiot Kills Favorite Family Pet. <laughs> Perspective is important. What you look at is important. What you see is important. Because what you see, you become. The scripture is full of pictures of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? The scriptures are like, if I may put it this way, it's like the God's family album. But guess who all the pictures are about? His favorite son, Jesus Christ. When you thumb through your Bible, when you look through your Bible, if you have eyes to see, you can see Jesus from Genesis through Revelation. Who you look at determines what you become and who you become. 2 Corinthians 3.18. You want to turn there? But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. When I was Terry said this morning, he said sometimes those, uh, <clears throat> those scriptures are difficult, the language is difficult, and I agree. So I want to give you another rendering of this verse. It's from the message. Again, this is 2 Corinthians 
It says, all of us, nothing between us and God, our faces shining with the brightness of His face, are so transfigured, much like the Messiah. Remember when Jesus was on the mountain, He did, yet began to glow? Paul's making reference to this. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Him. What you see is important. What you focus on is important. If as a young person you focus on griping and complaining, guess what you will be when you grow older? If you're a man, they'll call you a crotchety old man. <laughs> or a curmudgeon. How about that? That's a great word. It sounds like what it is, doesn't it? What you view, what you see, where you set your mind, the eyes of your mind, where you set that, your eyes determines what you become. The Scripture here says that we become like Jesus by looking at Jesus. Turn to the person beside you and say, look at Jesus. Ain't he something? That's Samson County. Too, good, too cool for school right there. Jesus is beautiful. Jesus is the most beautiful. Jesus is the most wonderful. How do we look at Jesus? This is very important this morning. I want you to get this. How do we see Jesus? We see Him by investigating the biblical record. You want to know why reading the Bible is important? Many people have a quiet time. I'd ask you to raise your hand if you have one, but that would only serve two purposes. And that number one is you could brag and the other person beside you who doesn't feel bad about it. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But what I am going to ask you to think about is why do you have that quiet time? I don't have quiet times. When I'm with the Lord, it's, it's not quiet. Why? Because to meditate on God means to talk to yourself out loud. And every time the psalms were sung, they had instrumental accompaniment. So I don't know anything about a quiet time, really, in the Lord. I do know about quieter times than others. I do know about meditating on His Word. You see, I want to encourage you. We look at Jesus by meditating on what the Word has to say about Him. Now, in the list, next few minutes, let me just uh, give you some pictures from God's picture book here. I said, how you see Jesus is important. Because if you see Him as whimsical, if you see Him as untrustworthy, how are you going to have faith in Him? If you see Him, let me, let me put it a little closer to home. If you see Jesus as working for everybody else, but not for you, then how are you going to put faith in Him? But the Word describes a very different Jesus. The Word describes... If you see Jesus in the Word, if you see Him as He is caring, if you see Him as He is involved in lives, as you see Him and He is quick to heal, He is quick to encourage, He is quick to provide, faith is going to incubate in your heart. And you're going to see the promises of God come to pass in your life. But all of that is dependent on how you see Him. Well, Carrie, isn't that taken care of when we get saved? No. There are lots of Christians who are going to heaven but have no idea what Jesus looks like. There are lots of Christians who are going to heaven but have no idea what Jesus' personality is like because they've been told a lie. They've accepted the truth of His death and resurrection but they have not been shown the beauty of who He is for this present life. One of the reasons I love coming down here on, on the third Saturday when I have an opportunity is because I get to see the body of Christ in operation. Amen. Amen. Most Sunday services, you don't see the body of Christ in operation. You see the body of Christ come together, but you don't see it in operation. And that's okay. Sunday has a purpose, a specific purpose. But the purpose when the body of Christ comes together here on Saturdays is to be involved in the lives of people who need people. That's right. Mostly people who need the Lord. 
but the Lord has given. Norman said this morning, our lives have been enriched when he was praying. God enriches our lives and the lives of others through people. Amen. Did you know that? God uses people to enrich our lives. He made us to need one another. He made us to connect with one another. That's why when we come together on a morning like this, there are things that transpire and transfer among us that, that, wow, how did that happen? How did that take place? Because the Spirit of God is in people and God is enriching our lives through one another. My life was enriched in worship this morning as Dylan and the guys led us in, in musical worship. I got to see some things about Jesus as, as the music was going on and the words were sung that I had not considered this morning. Did you? I said to see Jesus is to meditate on what the Word has to say about it. That's why it's important that our words to our songs are scripturally correct. Because the songs, Paul said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. He mentioned, by the way, singing more than he mentioned studying. It's just a side note, but there it is. In my studies, I found that to be true. Paul encouraged us to sing to ourselves, to ourselves, and to one another. Why? Because we're singing pictures of Jesus. We're singing what the Word has to say about Him. We are thumbing through God's photo book, if you will, by singing scripturally accurate psalms. Let's look at Jesus in the Old Testament. One of the primary ways I learn is by comparison. So when I see, uh, for example, in Luke 18 and 19, there's a story of, remember the rich young ruler? And then what happened with the rich young ruler? Scripture says after Jesus told him to go and sell all that he had, he went away sad, right? Because he couldn't part with one thin shekel. And then the church says, well, that's because money is evil. The Bible has never said money is evil. The Bible says the love of money is evil. And if you want to use that for your proof texting, then go to the very next chapter. I love the way the Holy Spirit puts chapters back to back. I said I learned by comparison. The very next chapter is of another rich man to whom Jesus never said, go sell all that you have and follow me. And I could go a long way with that, but I just want you to understand that when he went to Zacchaeus' house, he never told him to give everything he had away. It would be very inconsistent for Jesus to meet with one rich man and require all he had, meet with another rich man and never require anything. Would it not? So the money was not the issue. The heart was the issue. I learned by comparison to rich men. But the outcome is very different because of the heart of each individual. Let's look at um, Old, Old Testament pictures. Isaac. How is Isaac a picture of Jesus? Anybody have any ideas? <clears throat> he was the son of promise. Genesis 20, when God required Isaac's life at the hands of his father, God said to Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son whom you love. God's really pushing it now. The son whom you love and offer him his sacrifice. Amazing. But God was not wanting Isaac. God was giving us a picture of Jesus Christ, God's Son, God's only Son, the Beloved of God. Then we have Joseph. Joseph was given a picture of his future. Remember the story of Joseph? And he had a dream. Won't get into the dream. It's not the important thing right this minute. But it was a picture of his destiny. God loves to give pictures. By the way, before Isaac came along, Abraham got a picture. God took him out under the stars and said, here's what your nation's going to look like. You're going to be the father of many. Here's what your nation's going to look like. 
God gave Joseph a picture of his destiny. And don't you know Joseph wondered about the picture of that destiny when he was sold, thrown into a pit, sold, spent three years in prison. And yet, he became bread for the nations. He became the right-hand man in the most powerful nation in the world at that time, Egypt. He became bread for the nations. Having been forsaken by his father, sold off by his brothers, does this sound familiar? He became bread for the nations. And then he took a Gentile wife. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was thought dead. Jesus was forsaken by His Father. Jesus took a Gentile bride because the Jewish bride rejected Him for 2,000 years. The church, which is Gentile, has been the bride of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the New Testament for a second time. Just for a moment. And look at a couple of pictures of Jesus in the New Covenant. Remember Jesus and the Roman centurion. What did the Roman centurion need? Anybody know? What, what did he need? The Roman centurion came and made a request of Jesus. His servant was sick. His servant was sick. Jesus sent him home and said, let me think about this a while. Your servant's learning something in this, in this sickness. And, uh, and I'll let you know if I decide to heal him. Is that the way the story went? Just check it. No. He started to the man's house, to the centurion's house. And the centurion said, well, hey, wait a minute. You don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word. How many of you have ever said to God, just speak the word? Scripture says Jesus marveled at this man's faith. So he spoke the word. The servant was healed. Then there's the Syrophoenician woman. She was obviously a Gentile woman. And she was serving at a house where Jesus was eating. And she had a child that was sick. Demon possessed, I believe. And she asked Jesus to heal. Now, watch this. If Jesus had not been kind, loving, and one who heals, why are so many people coming to Him to ask for His help? If Jesus doesn't want to heal then why are so many people coming to ask Him for help? If Jesus doesn't want to deliver us from demonic oppression, why are so many people coming to be delivered from devils? I want you to see the picture of Jesus this morning. The Syrophoenician woman made her request, and Jesus said, it is not good. This is a hard saying. <laughs> it is not good to take the children's bread and to give it to the little dogs. Now that would have offended me would it have offended you? But this woman, in, rather than becoming offended, in humility said, Yes, Lord, but even the little dogs get to eat the crumbs from the children's table. And Jesus said, Be it done unto you according to your faith. And her daughter was delivered immediately. Jesus was a man born under the law, came to people under the law, that's why He spoke to her in such a measure. He was first to the Jews. That was God's plan. And then he, the message of the Gospel would move to the Gentiles. So He had a reason for speaking the way He spoke. Yet her humility and faith in His goodness resulted in the answer to her need. See the picture. Did you know that Jesus enjoys hanging out with you? Well, Carrie, he doesn't enjoy hanging out with me because I'm not perfect. If you wait till you're perfect to enjoy the company of Jesus, you never will in this life. Amen. This church was perfect till Dennis joined it. Amen. Just wanted to wake you up there. Thank you, Dennis, for being the butt of the joke. You will never be perfect in this life. Your perfection does not merit, listen carefully, I'm, I'm really preaching now. Your, pers your abilities, your um, perfection does not merit the presence of God. That's right. 
Let me say it stronger. Your attempts at perfection cannot merit the presence of God. It is only Jesus Christ who has become lightning rod between heaven and earth and absorbed all, I said all, of our sin and punishment in His body. He absorbed all the wrath of God against sin, which was against you because we were born in sin. Not because of what you did, but because of how you were born. You didn't incur God's wrath because you were a sinner. You incurred God's wrath because you were born in sin. The blood was infected. Did you know that? People are not sinners because they sin. People sin because they are born in sin. That's right. That's right. I can see that I'm not getting here. Let me help you. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but I want you to think, and I'll be able to tell by the expression on your face. How many of you this week have failed God? Just this week. And those of you who are trying to put on a stone face, you did anyway. And it's okay. Your failure does not determine your position in God. Your failure does not determine, I'll say that again, your position in God. Jesus Christ determines your position in God. He is beautiful. <laughs> he gives us what we do not deserve. And He keeps us from what we do deserve. That's called grace and mercy. Grace brings you what you do 